Um, then collaborative robots, robots, which is what the Stryker Mako robotic system is, and it is indeed a robot by all definitions, and it collaborates with the surgeon, and I'll go into some more detail about what that means. The, the control loop, what that means is, is how do you keep things in the places that you want them to be? Control loops exist in all manner of things. Your car engine management systems has dozens of control loops in them. Uh, we can talk about that if, if that's of interest to you. But, so let's talk about the evolution. Where has it been? Static plans back in the 50, 50s, surgeons would say, okay, this time I'm going to replace this joint uh, based on um, basic x-rays. And then we go into the 90s with navigated execution. The, one of the biggest challenges about orthopedic surgery is understanding in 3D space where things are. Where's the, where do you want to cut the bone? Where do you not want to cut the bone? Those sorts of things. So navigated freehand power tools is the next step in the early 2000s where um, you know where the anatomy is. And in the early 2000s, with a navigated power tool, you know where the tool is placed so you can bring those two interfaces together. So then in again in the 2000s, the late 2000s, robotically assisted surgery was a, a huge breakthrough because one of the things that robots do really well is they know where they are in space, far better than where humans know they are. So this is the, the family tree, the history, if you will, of the Mako system, which was an acquisition that Stryker bought Mako back in 2013, as you note here on the timeline. Um, but it was introduced by Mako Surgical Corporation with a partial knee in 2009 and progressed all the way over to the first Mako total knee case in 2016. Absolutely game-changing uh, procedure. And uh, uh, later in the presentation, I'll talk about how many thousands of total knees have been replaced in that time frame. In addition to that is uh, total hip uh, was launched a couple of years ago. So that gives you a glimpse of the a glimpse of the timeline of where it's been. So Mako Smart Robotics is what I'm going to spend the next I don't know 20 minutes or so uh, talking about. So the the punchline here is to know more and cut less. You want to remove the bone that you want to remove, and you want to leave the bone that you that is important. And what this um, hinges around is knowing where you want to place the implant. Because if you think about what it was like 40 years ago, just putting an implant in was a success. Now the question is balancing the, um, the geometries of the patient and making the decision on do I, so you have a diseased knee and a healthy knee, do you match those? Soft tissue, we'll go more into that in a moment. So the MAKO system supports three different applications, total hip, total knee, and partial knee. The numbers of partial knees are a lot less uh, than the total knee. That's where only one cond condyle of the uh, knee is resected. To very, a partial knee is a very challenging procedure because you have to balance the two condyles. You don't have all of the degrees of freedom that you have with a total knee. Um, so those are the three applications. And then what else goes into the system? is we have the robot, of course, and then camera stand and guidance cart. That's the total, uh, and we'll talk more about instruments in just a second, of the um, Mako Smart Robotic System. So we, we talked about the system overall, but these are the elements that go into the planning of the placement of an implant. Start off with a CT scan. So you can get the information of what's going on with the patients, the amount of disease, the things that are needed that call for an implant, and then pre-planning. This is where the surgeon explores the question of how far, what's the varicose valgus, what's the alignment that is optimum for this patient. And uh, one of my roles at Stryker is supporting cadaveric research labs where Stryker aligns with thought-leading surgeons from literally around the world 
And I had the privilege of being a fly on the wall for lunch with a couple of these guys, a guy from England, a guy from Australia, and they were having, and a guy from, a couple of guys from the U.S., of course, a spirited debate on where should the implants be placed. Because in point of fact, it's not in the textbooks that say this is the kind of alignment. As I alluded to a few moments ago, you know, as I stand in front of you, I'm a little bit knock-kneed or bow-legged, varigus, valgus, whatever, and what should it be? Uh, prior to this capability, it was, hey, this is what the textbook said. I think it's 20 degrees. I'm not sure. But this is what how the alignment should be. And with this system and with the CT scans, it creates a 3D model of the patient's anatomy. And then the surgeon has the ability to look at the anatomy and say, this is where I want to place the implant. Then the cool thing is, then you move into um, interoperative registration and balancing and the haptic bones. But once the surgical wound is opened and the surgeon can visualize the anatomy, the surgeon can say, oh, wait a minute. I had it designed for 18 degrees. And I don't think that's what I want to do now. He'll talk to the uh, macoplasty specialist or MPS and say, I want to take it to 19 degrees. They do that on the fly. And then they say, okay, now we're going to cut the bone, resect the bone for the implant placement. Um, I've had the privilege of being in the OR to watch a number of the cases. I know Rob is, has been there as well. And um, it's, it's really exciting. The systems that we work on, the end effectors, um, get used for about six minutes in a one-hour procedure. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a little disappointing, but the value it brings is, is tremendous. Let's see, is there anything else I wanted to say on this slide? Um, nope. So haptics, that is, you know, we were chatting as we were forming about intellectual property and uh, Stryker's intellectual property portfolio on the haptics, which, what is a haptic? It is the boundaries of where you want the saw blade to go and where you don't want the saw blade to go. Turns out that's a big deal because once you have the ability, the resolution to say, I want to cut here, I don't want to cut there, well, then putting the blade where you want it is what the haptics are about. It creates invisible boundaries. Traditional orthopedic surgery uses cut blocks or miter box type things. When you have the robot, you don't need that anymore because you have the haptic boundaries. As you bring the saw blade, which I guess this is as good time as any, so you get any attached to the end of the robot arm here and then presents the blade to actually their six cuts prepare a total knee and it does uh, some of the cuts because of the limits of the dexterous workspace or the space that the robot can actually reach this presents the saw blade at a 90 degree angle to uh, solve some of those problems so Sure. <laughs> and if you do, we'll make another one. Uh, so that 
the, since that's attached to the end of the robot arm, the robot knows where it's placed in space, so it leverages the haptic boundaries. So it cuts the stuff you want to cut and not the stuff you don't. Um, and there's all kinds of white papers behind that, as noted in the footnotes. So <clears throat> the, the total program leverages evidence-based MAKO technology that uh, we, we talked about the technology. It's been in the field for some time. There's a number of research papers that compare previous um, orthopedic surgeries to robotic-assisted uh, surgeries, and they are better. Clinically successful implants. That's uh, Stryker. The breadth of Stryker technology is, is amazing. And so we've had um, implants in the marketplace that we are using the robot to place. You might ask the question of, well, what about robotically enabled implants? Hmm, something we're thinking about for sure. So, um, and then the Mako product, product specialist, the MPS, that's the person that actually operates the robot to support the surgeon. And then insightful data and analytics and, and patient engagement. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but how can you encourage the patient to continue with physical, th physical therapy and do all the things for the desired outcome? So <clears throat> our uh, robot arm has six degrees of freedom, which means it can move in, in all these different ways. Um, and this robot is um, the current application does not operate in an automatic or autonomous way. But the haptic boundaries are implemented because of the way the surgeon manipulates the robot. The robot moves, or the surgeon moves the robot through space, and then it hits a haptic boundary and it stops there um, instead of going to other places. So um, this slide and the next slide is about as deep as I'm going into uh, robotic uh, mumbo jumbo. Um, but uh, forward kinematics, as you can see, the gold arrow sweeps from the base of the robot up to the tool center point or the teeth that's actually cutting it. And so, the, <clears throat> excuse me, those calculations go forward to say, where do I want the robot placed? X, Y, Z, and alpha, beta, and gamma are all of the, the parameters around where that robot's going. Turns out, so I've only been doing new product development stuff for 38 years, and this is um, arguably the most complex math that I have bumped into. And I defer to my friends in the back row for a lot of this work. Yeah, the guy that just turned around. Uh, <laughs> because uh, it does get uh, complicated quickly. And you see the... Um, green, red, and blue, uh, it's called a reference frame, so you know which way is up, and how that translates throughout the system um, is an important thing. So we talked about forward kinematics, and this is inverse kinematics, so it's going the other direction to say, my, my procedure needs me to be in a different spot, and so inverse uh, kinematics is, is important for that. Um, questions about that stuff? And oh, by the way, at any, yeah, not you, uh, <laughs> at any point except for Rob, um, by the way, these, the, the people, as it turns out on the right half, are my friends from Stryker. And so if you ask me a question that I can't answer, I'm going to dish it off to these friends. Um, but please feel free to interrupt me because I don't want to listen to myself talk for however long. Uh, and if there's something that I hit on and you go, wait a minute, I want to understand more about that. I would much rather have a conversation than, um, uh, God forbid, lecture for an hour. Because you guys go to those enough already, I'm sure. So uh, <clears throat> localization is uh, this thing here in the middle is a camera that has two sensors in it for 3D space. Um, it's a bit like GPS. That's a huge stretch. But that is the device that uses, uh, see the things in the red circles? Those are trackers that the camera sees. And so it now knows the location of <clears throat> the robot and the uh, femur and the tibia. 
see these trackers are absolutely bolted to the anatomy. It's one of the surgeon comments is there are times where he'll get more complaints from the patients about the, um, the incision that starts with a P, I forget the name of it, for these tracker pins that screw into the bone and the pain from that than the total knee. But it's that <clears throat> firm connection gives us the ability to link where the anatomy is in our system to where it is in real life. Making that connection is fundamental for successful collaborative robotic systems. If you don't, if you can't do that, then it, it just doesn't work. Questions about that? So <clears throat> registration is an important part of this, where you can see here on the left, the initial estimate versus the final alignment. The top left, <clears throat> excuse me, the green line is where the system is assumed the anatomy is located. And you can see it's off. But then the final alignment with these, uh, you can see those white and blue dots. A surgeon will take a, an instrument called a pointer. It's got a sharp point on one end, duh, and it's got an array on the other end. And you click on various points of the anatomy, and then that aligns what's going on in the system to what's going on in the real world. It's so it's localized. Um, surgeons hate that part of the step because <clears throat> it's a little tedious and it takes time. So we're working on ways to fix that. But you can see this is a pointer, sharp point here, and just outside of that frame is where the, uh, the array is that the camera can see and say, technology systems are really quite good about saying this is where this is at in 3D space, far better than what humans can do. Okay. So now you guys have seen uh, the, uh, the saw go around, but the left portion of this frame is what's going on on the display. So it's an animated thing where you can see as the green is removed, it's being cut. And this is what's happening in real time with the resection of the bone by the uh, oscillatory saw. So that's one of the six cuts, <clears throat> excuse me, that are necessary for a total knee replacement. So what is, what's the value proposition in the healthcare environment? <coughs> Excuse me, as we were talking earlier, technology is important, but the other things that go along with the solution are also important for successful deployment. So, because guess what? These, these systems, they're about a million bucks a piece. Yeah, so it's pretty expensive. A substantial investment, as the slide says. You gotta have evidence that shows it's better for the patient, it's better for the payers, and it's better for the surgeons. Everybody has to win. And I'm happy to stand in front of you tonight and say, yes, we have all of that in independent um, research papers that support that. So that's part of the value proposition. So leading a robotics market. So it's been deployed for 16 years. Over 6,000 MAKO procedures have been conducted. The vast majority of those are total knees. Um, which has been a huge game changer. Uh, it's the, one of the more recent introductions, but a robotically assisted total knee is, uh, has been fantastic. So we sold over 1,400 systems, been in a hundred, over 150 ambulatory surg surgical centers and uh, a bunch in teaching institutions. Not exactly an accident because if you get trained on it in part of your res residency or fellowship, you're gonna take that into the field. So, and so all of the peer reviewed uh, papers, there's, there's been a bunch. So it's a pretty cool time to be in orthopedics. It is a revolutionary uh, kind of changes that are taking place. Um, when Kevin Lobo chose to buy Mako in 2013, it was like a $1.5 billion investment. And uh, he didn't exactly bet Stryker on it, but it was it was a big deal. 
Um, and it has absolutely changed the way um, orthopedic surgery is being conducted. So it's, uh, it is a revolutionary time. So you introduced me as an R&D guy. Absolutely. I'm a far more of an R&D guy than a clinical um, guy. But um, so what do you expect from, because these are all uh, with uh, one exception, um, all R&D folks. <laughs> Sorry, Karen. <laughs> Um, and so what do you expect from R&D? In the past, it's, hey, give me some technology that's going to work and make my life better. And so here's the list. You know, you got to have lower hospital admission rates. You know, you can read it as well as I can, get people back to work, get them out of physical therapy, get them off their pain meds. That's what they want. Um, you know, it, it just blows my mind that you can have a total knee replaced and not spend the night in the hospital. Um, the the flip side of that is uh, my maternal grandfather um, had crippling arthritis in his hips, and I have no memory of him not being on crutches or in a wheelchair. Fast forward 50 years, my dad's 91. He's had a hip replacement, shoulder replacement, and uh, yep, he was in a wheelchair when they rolled him out after his total hip, but he wasn't in that wheelchair for very long. So the, the, the technology is cool. Um, early function and pain outcomes, episode of care. So let's move a little bit away from the direct robotic technology and talk about some of the, the broader environment. You all know about the cloud, no doubt, but what about the stuff that comes in and the stuff that comes out, and, and what does that mean? So within the last couple of years, Stryker's always reorganizing itself, but we were moved into a portion of Stryker called Digital and Robotic Enabling Technologies. And the digital piece of that is, is what we're talking about here. Managing the big data, working through that, leveraging that, um, finding ways to make healthcare better. That's, that's Stryker's um, mission and values is to, together with our customers, we work to make healthcare better. And leveraging the cloud is to wait, one way to do that. You can see the data sources, devices, so forth and so on, and then how that knits together. So in, insightful data analytics, a lot of what you saw on the previous slide, insights, the analysis of that. Once you have that and analyze it, then you can take action on it. So back to smart robotics, the evidence-based, getting that together, clinically successful, and, uh, and, and good robots and, and people to operate them. Services included <clears throat> with insightful data analytics is, is facility reported outcomes, a dashboard for a hospital to say, this is what's going on in your facility, and this is how we can help you make it better, all the way to mobile apps to be a recovery coach so they can be with you and have you done your physical therapy today or not. <clears throat> So this includes, expands to the digital ecosystem. What takes place before the operation? What takes place during the operation, which is what I have mostly focused on? And then after the operation, um, you know, encompassing more than, hey, my knee hurts, to how bad does your knee hurt? What can we do to fix it? So the DRE or digital and robotic enabling technologies, here are all the things that are at play. And so if you're thinking about what does the future look like, this is a list that you might want to reflect on. But so I've talked a lot about robotics. That's what I've done at Stryker for most of the last 10 years. Guidance and sensors, how that fits together. <clears throat> Augmented and virtual reality, how does that work? And actually that's what um, the, the foundational elements when you register a patient's anatomy, that links it into the computer. And so then the next step of saying, can I see this um, virtually or not? Um, turns out there's some technological challenges in the OR, not the least of which is the sterile field, uh, the surgeon's tolerance for having heavy things on his or her head, and so forth. Uh, computer vision, um, electronic health record integration, cloud connectivity we already talked about, product security and privacy, you know, the last thing you want to hear is a cybersecurity breach of your healthcare information. Um, and so that's what we're talking about there. And then the management of software development, 
turns out managing things that are invisible like software is a challenge. And it's not just Stryker that uh, is challenged with managing um, uh, software development. And then artificial intelligence and machine learning, how that fits together. And you can start thinking about all of the data that exists and say, how can that be leveraged with appropriate safeguards around um, personal privacy, how that all fits together. And then strategy and experience. You know, I was, was talking about that brief lunch I had with a surgeon saying, well, what should the alignment be? By the way, they have some very strong opinions on, on what that, how that should work out. And then the intellectual property rights. Um, Stryker's portfolio was very strong, and I'm very happy about that because that's, that does create a firewall for us um, as the competition starts to build in. Any questions about this? I mean, the, we'll talk more about some of the, the mega trends in industry, but with respect to healthcare, um, this, this one slide does talk about a lot of the things that, and what's this gonna look like 10 years from now or 20 years from now? Um, I don't know if I said it with, this, with everybody in the room, but people from within an industry are typically the worst people for predicting what happens next because <clears throat> I know how hard it is to do this stuff. And uh, to be successful is, is hard, um, but there's always somebody out there with other ideas and, and how can we, can we do this. So examples of data tracked for our customers. This would be our uh, uh, providers, you know, the operational, clinical, operating room, and patient outcomes. Because if we can provide that kind of resolution, then <clears throat> it builds the case for why do I want to spend another million dollars on a second robot or a third robot? Uh, I believe the Hospital for Special Services um, in New York City has over five robots. Um, and so, you know, they are clearly saying, hey, this makes sense for us. It makes lots of things better. So dashboards, this is an example of a, a dashboard when you deploy a robotic system. And so the top left are the case volumes, bone registration, how many minutes does it take the surgeon to align the bone into the system? Um, someplace on here, it talks uh, the, the time. And then um, yeah, uh, to the first case and, and ligament balancing, I haven't really spoken much about it all, but that is the soft tissue, the alignment of the soft tissue to the implant. And that's uh, the cousin really to the <clears throat> um, anatomical alignment. So the individual surg surgical plan where the pre op assessment says, yep, you're a candidate for a total knee. And then the functional planning, what should the alignment look like? And then actual conduction of the procedure where my wonderful equipment that we develop gets used for six minutes out of our surgery and then um, helping the uh, patients uh, have a full recovery. So then <clears throat> if we start looking at treatment clustering to say, what is the, uh, I heard a surgeon the other day say, it used to be they would come into the orthopedic surgeon's office and say, help me walk without pain. I just want to go visit my grandkids. And now you can see the little guy playing golf. It's, I want to get my golf game back. And that's a different set of expectations than what we had before. The other thing is most the um, uh, time for these kinds of ortho proced orthopedic procedures are happening in younger and younger patients. And so then that implant is going to be in the patient for a much longer period of time. You can begin to see the scope and the scale of, of talking about accurate placement. Um, <clears throat> so we can optimize things for the patient solution. So we've talked a lot about robotics and it's not just the robot anymore. So here are some of the things that Stryker brings to bear. The SOMA uh, database, which is 3D design of images and analytics around uh, bone anatomy. 
Um, when you start thinking about statistically based implant designs, you need to have a broad base of what's the range of femurs and condyle placement and so forth. The SOMA database is, is something that enables that. Additive manufacturing. Um, so I know this side of the room, and I think at least three or four folks have 3D, they can 3D plastic print parts as hobbyists. I don't know about this side of the room, but um, so additive manufacturing is traditional manufacturing is subtractive where you machine metal away. Additive, and I've got a couple more slides on that. We'll talk about that. That's a game changer. Robotically enabled implants, I foreshadowed that a few moments ago, and the digital uh, ecosystem. Those are key things that as, as we look into our crystal balls or the future is how do those come together? So a cool slide transition. You got to have at least one of those in your deck. Um, this is in uh, Angrove, Ireland, which has um, about 100, I think they're two kilowatt laser additive systems where you take uh, powdered titanium that's like 99.9% .9 pure and then center it with a laser beam and create parts that look like these. So you might say, well, Chris, what's this rough surface all about? Turns out titanium is a material that bone really likes and bone really likes to be um, interfaced with a specific pattern, a lattice like structure. And this is a custom designed part of the implant that, so that is the acetabular shell that goes into the patient's, patient's acetabulum, of course. And then it is impacted in and then the bone interfaces with that and that is very difficult to machine with traditional procedures, but with the additive manufacturing that Stryker has pioneered partnering with a key supplier um, has, has been a very successful implant. Because as I talked earlier about getting implants in patients earlier, fixation of those implants is, is absolutely vital. And moving from um, glue or adhesive, which is a very harsh substance, to something like this that the bone naturally grows into, it really enhances the, uh, the longevity of it. So these, the cones, the tibial cones, uh, symmetrical and asymmetrical are frequently used for revision surgery. Something's gone wrong with the initial implant and those cone-based implants uh, support that. And then uh, the two, I need a point up here, don't I? These two are uh, new developments in um, spine surgery, surgeries. Questions about the ad additive manufacturing stuff? That's a pretty cool trend in, in my opinion. So trends or factors. <clears throat> so if you go back to way back machine, even before I was born, uh, <laughs> you, yeah. the uh, first industrial revolution, the second, third, and we are living in the fourth industrial revolution. The cyber physical systems, uh, internet of things, networks, um, you know, I earned my master's degree before the internet and you guys would look, how could you do graduate work without the internet? Well, turns out the doors of the library worked out pretty well. Um, but uh, so the, the fourth industrial revolution is the connection of the digital, physical and biological interfaces. And I'm pretty sure if, if I ever do get blessed with grandchildren that they'll say, grandpa, 40 years ago, did you work on stuff that actually sawed people's bones? And I'm gonna go, yeah. And you know what the biological solutions 40 years from now, I have no idea what they're gonna be, but uh, um, I'm excited to think about that. So, <clears throat> so it impacts all of the disciplines and economies and industries around the world is what the fourth revolution is. Um, not a very revolutionary statement. So what's now and what's next from a technology perspective? Smart cities, 3D printing, we talked about that from a plastics perspective, all the way to, um, in essence, the equivalent of 3D printing of titanium implants. Um, and of course that leads to uh, oncology uh, implants. Uh, how do you restore the bone for that you've had to remove critical elements of, of a bony anatomy due to uh, cancer situations and then creating custom implants to support that. It's pretty exciting. 
predictive and prescriptive analytics. It's the big data, artificial intelligence. You know, the power behind all of that is uh, um, makes my head hurt, to be honest. And then uh, the robotics. Um, I think it's a cute picture. Um, you know, the robot that I showed you in the beginning of the presentation doesn't look at all like that. Most collaborative robots don't look like that because you don't need all that stuff to uh, accomplish the mission. Self-driving cars, spending 30 years in the automotive industry. Um, Self-driving cars, I don't know when they're really going to arrive. I think we've shifted from the technology to the litigation part of it, and um, that slows things down a, a good bit. Everything and everybody is connected. You're all walking around with amazing computers in your pockets or your hands, and you think about 4 billion connected people, 4 trillion in revenue opportunities. I mean, the numbers are just mind-blowing. Um, and then radical system-wide innovation can happen in a few years. You've seen the timeline on the robotic industry. You know, we're roughly year 15 of fully collaborative robotics. Um, and how fast will that, you know, it's going to go faster and faster. And then um, technology, why is all this happening now? It's the processing power, the, the ability to computers, to program computers, moves things so much faster. And the cloud, 5G, all of that stuff. Customer experience, this is a fun one. Um, and the words on the screen, a customer's perspective, all their interactions um, and throughout their business relationships. So, you know, today you may be doing it right now because you're getting bored with me and saying, oh, I need something for my cat. And you go on Amazon and uh, is there any doing that right now? Um, <laughs> And uh, so, you know, it's going to be here for you tomorrow. And so, well, why can't I have that level of customer service with healthcare? Turns out ordering something from Amazon might be a little easier than having your knee replaced, but customer experience is the new battleground for brands. And, and what does that mean? And the transference of those expectations from the consumer world into all other walks is, is an important part of it. So patient consumerism, um, you can see that. And so 51% of the consumers believe convenience and access to care is the most important factor. 81% of the consumers are dissatisfied with their healthcare experiences. You know, healthcare is one of the, the only product I think we buy and we don't know how much it's gonna cost us. You know, do you, you walk in and you buy a car? Yeah, I'll take that one. Do you just drive it off the lot and expect a bill in the mail? I don't think so. <clears throat> Excuse me, but in healthcare, that's kind of the kind of the way it works. And a superior customer experience strengthens patient engagement and correlates to higher uh, hospital margins. There's more money to be had. So things to think about as whiteboard issues are improved patient experience. What can we do so when that patient goes home, they're not complaining about the incision where they we bolted a tracker to their uh, tibia and uh, femur. I want to say thigh, but I shouldn't do that in medical school. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, a better, you know, make people healthier and improve you know, improve the staff so the staff has uh, less challenges. One of the things I don't know where the saw wound up, but it has a rotating handle on it. If you push the buttons in the right way to make it easier for the surgeon to grab the saw while they're in the cases. One of the things that we are challenged with are the ergonomics of our systems because of the relatively short career that orthopedic surgeons uh, can enjoy at this point due to arthritis in their thumbs from swinging hammers and running saws. So the more of that that we can automate with a robot, the less impact, literally, it has on the surgeon. And then lowering the cost of care. Can we do this better, faster, cheaper? And much of the savings from robotics is less revisions, less time in recovery, uh, less pain meds, those sorts of things. I think we're about time neutral or maybe a moment or two less for a robotics case versus a manual case. So this may be the part that you've been waiting impatiently for all evening long, but thoughts about the future. And this is where I have to say is that 
forecasts or predictions about the future from a guy inside the industry is probably going to be wrong uh, because we know how hard it is to do these things. But one of them is what do humans do well and what do robots do well? Humans have pretty good judgment with the proper training, good eye-hand coordination, excellent dexterity at the human scale, able to integrate and act on multiple information sources. Pilots do that all the time. Um, be interesting to ask faculty if they think humans are easily trained or not. I, that could be debated. And then um, versatile and able to improvise. Humans do that really well. Robots suck at that. Um, but what do robots do well? Geometric accuracy, knowing where the robot is in 3D space. By the way, as, as noted on the credit on the slide, this was uh, from a textbook that was published almost 20 years ago. So it turns out humans haven't changed much and frankly, neither have robots. Um, robots don't get tired, they do break down. Um, you can radiate them most of the time without a problem. They can be designed to operate in many different scales and motions and payloads. Think about the Da Vinci, one of the things that it's a master slave, but you can filter out human tremors on the micro scale. And uh, the robots can indeed integrate multiple sources of numerical and sensor data. That's what the programming does. That's what haptic boundaries are about. So those are the things that robots do well. Um, so what are the limits of humans and robots? We get tired, tremors in our hands, limited manipulation and ability outside the natural scale. Our end effectors are big and bulky and uh, limited geometric accuracy. I really don't know where this spot is within sub-millimeter accuracy. And we're dirty, and we don't like infections, and we don't like to be irradiated. Not from, unless, you know. And so <clears throat> robots really have no judgment, and uh, they don't adapt to new situations. And um, limited dexterity, that is one of the things that is advanced over the last 20 years. That's really technological technology developments. And then uh, limited ability to integrate and interpret complex information. If it's part of the program, absolutely. If it's not part of the program, um, robots go, yeah, I have no idea. So that's what robots do well. That's what, com what humans do well. Um, so what's next? I am certain robots are here to stay. And that's not just because I'm brilliant, because these guys will tell you I'm not. But if you look at other industries, once a robot enters an industry, from automotive assembly lines to whatever, it doesn't leave because of the advantages it brings. And predictions about the future are particularly difficult because my crystal ball is any better than yours. And I, I do know a little bit about new product development. Um, and so where's it going? Um, one of the missions of, of robots is there are surgeons on the planet today that are absolutely amazing surgeons and can do things for joint replacement for special cases <clears throat> that are almost incomprehensible. The idea of deploying robots widely throughout the United States and the world, one of the goals is to make good surgeons, great surgeons. So you don't have to go to a specialty uh, hospital in a big city to get a similar outcome. And, and that's one of the advantages of deploying the 1400 of these robots. There's a robot in every state in the United States. Um, many of the countries in Western Europe have robots. And so it, the deployment is wide. Um, so leveling the field to provide that capability is, is one of the things that is happening. Um, beyond that, the innovation really is, is boundless. You know, where can this go? Um, I know there's, there's a, a challenge, and I won't get the anatomy right, so forgive me, I'm just an engineer, that you need to, it's, it's an auditory uh, balance challenging, an inner ear deficiency. And it turns out the bones here are particularly hard and the anatomy is particularly delicate. And so to open, to get to that, to fix it, it's a bit of a crapshoot on are you going to do, you know, do no harm, right? And so that's um, a good example of a potential robotic 
application. That's the good news. The bad news is um, the number of people that have that case is fairly small. And um, one of the things that in the economic system that we live in is you have to have a business case. And that business case is driven by, does is it a viable business case for the manufacturer, the buyer, and the patient? Because we're all, is, is this a business for everybody? And does that line up? So it's about a million hips and knees a year. It's probably a little bit over than that now. And uh, you can start to think about if, if you each knee replacement has a significant implant with it. That, that is a great enabler of the business case. I mean, it's the reality of business. So you may have noticed that I did not give you any specific predictions about the future, because I don't have them. <laughs> it's, the, it's the short answer. But uh, somebody asked me at least one question, so I'll know you're awake. <laughs> I actually did have one question, Great. Chris, and this is sort of, I guess, on the behalf of any student who might be interested in like a career in surgery in the future. So say, you know, a surgeon wants to potentially add like a robotic system to their toolkit. Um, what's sort of the process that they have to go through in terms of implementing that into whatever hospital system they're working in? So <clears throat> if the hospital already has the robot, it's a matter of training and certification. And there's training facilities in Fort Lauderdale that surgeons flow through on a regular basis to develop uh, the certification to operate with the robot. So that's one answer to the question. To convince the hospital they practice in to spend the million dollars, that's a little more complicated and it's, it's the business case. But um, so it may come as a shock, but I did not create this slide deck specifically for you guys tonight. Um, my boss, I borrowed some of these from him, and part of these slides were a, a sales presentation to sell robots to hospitals. And uh, that's why there were some references in there to research papers that said, I'm not just telling you as a, I'm a striker guy, so what do you expect me to say? But we've studied it and says, yes, this system provides these positive outcomes to create the business case. You know, what's your return on investment? You know, all of those harsh business realities that it's, you know, Stryker's a business. Um, this medical school is a business. Um, it's just the way the world works. But uh, so you've got to convince them to spend the million dollars. And that's there's lots of ways to spend that, you know, the way the transaction is is managed. But uh, the search, I don't know how long it takes, how many cases the the to become certified to do um, robotically assisted surgeries, but that's why in that one slide early in the deck was the number of teaching institutions that the robots are in was to begin to address that question. I've been in uh, research labs where there are surgeons that are older than me and surgeons that are just a little bit older than you, actually perhaps quite a bit older, um, and it's it's an amazing contrast. The I'll call it the technology savvy, the younger ones, um, how they adopt to the robotic surgery compared to the the ones that have been doing it forever with a manual solution. It's a big difference. Any other questions? I'll go. Okay. Um, so you're right here in Kalamazoo. How many? systems are there locally? Like, are they at Borges? Are they at Bronson? Does the medical school have any? I don't think we do, do we? I, uh, <clears throat> that's a really good question, which is code for I have no idea. Um, I know there's, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, I didn't mention this earlier, Da Vinci is a soft tissue robot. And this is a hard tissue robot. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, okay. Uh, 
Yes. All right. Sort of uh, actually on the topic of soft tissue surgeries, we, we do have a couple questions in the chat. Okay. okay. So one of them is, um, do you anticipate these robotics being adopted for soft tissue surgeries in, like, say, the next couple decades? So <clears throat> the Da Vinci system with their intellectual property portfolio has the soft tissue market space um, well defined. And uh, one of the enabling technologies for orthopedic surgeries is it's based on hard tissue. And you can see the hard tissue with various imaging modalities. So as you do your planning, we use CT scans, to create 3D model and allow, you know, that it's all of that. Turns out the technological challenges of seeing and tracking soft tissue is not trivial and saying, where is that soft tissue? Um, there's, there's potential solutions, but it's, it's difficult. Um, so this is probably one of those inside predictions. I'm going, wow, it seems quite difficult. Um, <clears throat> but again, technologies do evolve and it's, uh, I, I don't know. Not now. Not now. Yeah. Uh, the second question in the chat, this is from um, Amanda. She's asking, does Stryker do any work in more biological versus more mechanical areas? Uh, the example was given of cancer requiring removal of more integral bone components that need to be replaced for somehow. Yeah. So um, I have a vague awareness that there is some research being conducted on biologics. That's all I know about. Um, and then the specific answer to the, uh, the uh, oncological uh, implants, which are typically custom implants where major portions of the bones are removed, is where that really shines. It comes through. Um, the folks in uh, our Mawa, New Jersey facility uh, do that work. Yeah, it's really quite exciting to think about the FDA approval process for a customized implant. And uh, um, they figured that out. So you can, I think it's it's roughly, I don't know, it's a brief period of time, I'll leave it at that, to go from here's a need. It's not, we're not quite to, oh, you open them up in the OR, you know, capture, capture some images and 3D print an implant and, and and then install it it's it's longer than that but not you know it's it's uh it's it's a reasonable time frame and oh by the way i would love to tell you more about robotic hand pieces but i can't talk about the stuff that we're developing right now <laughs> so this is the stuff that you can you can walk into an or well if they'd let you um and you would see those instruments being used so a question, I'm, I'm curious, I was having a conversation with someone the other day and we were talking about kind of how many advances have been being made in, you know, medicine and robotics and, you know, dealing with human health. Not a lot of advancement that we've seen lately in dentistry. Any thoughts? I'm just curious. Um, there, there may be a dentist in the room. Yeah. Am, I, am I right or not? I mean, it just seems that way. Yeah. So we're wondering, like, are there applications kind of like in what you're doing here, like, you know, robotic surgery on knees? Is, I mean, can we, is stuff like that coming for our mouths? I don't know. I don't mean to put you on the spot, Karen. No, I, yeah. I'm really not a great person to address that question, but, uh, you know, I, probably everybody's already familiar with the dental implants, which I was kind of looking at that when you had the uh, 3D printing with that metal titanium. I know they do roughen those so the bone can uh, grow into the implant, uh, but I don't have a good answer for your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I can safely say that's not in the portion of Stryker that I'm working on. Um, it's, uh, I have reviewed some white papers from the dental industry about um, bone resection 
uh, a much smaller scale, which is, you know, you compare that to bone mm -hmm. resection for a knee and how much material is removed is, you know, it's hugely different. But managing issues of thermal necrosis and, and those sorts of things are, are things that we are concerned about. And, and what can we do to minimize, uh, minimize that? They have to get much, much more miniaturized. Things tend to miniaturize over time. So. Yeah. Uh, I went to grad school in a, in a manufacturing uh, lab, and the, some of the greatest topics that were being done was how do you design a drill bit for bone mill in terms of burning them out? Yeah. And they were they they made all their money on making a drill bit for GM and Ford, mm -hmm. so they put a phase. Actually, and that turn on there it goes, <laughs> and that led me to another one of the questions I had written down. So you spent decades in automotive, yes, and then switched over to medical device. I mean, that's what a change of industry. What's that story? Just curious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to hear that too, please. <laughs> Can you unplug his mic? <laughs> well, it's not really as exciting as you might think. Um, Don Malakowski is a fellow Purdue alum, and uh, we serve on a board together at Purdue. And um, the automotive industry is legendary for its, its ups and downs. And 09, you might recall the Great uh, Recession, and uh, I lost confidence in the portion of the automotive industry that I was in. It was time to make a change. And I said, had lunch with uh, Don and I said, any opportunities? And he said, I don't know. Let's see what we can find out. And uh, um, from an industry perspective, it couldn't be more different. But turns out, so automotive electronics is complex stuff. And uh, turns out medical devices are complex stuff. And um, working with smart people on complex things is something that I enjoy. And uh, um, so the new product development process is, is similar. The regulatory impacts are hugely different. Automotive is lightly regulated. <laughs> Medical is not. Um, but uh, a lot of the work that we do is transformation of, here's an idea. Can we do this more than once? And oh, by the way, the autoclave turns out is a remarkably harsh environment. And that device that got passed around um, goes through the autoclave a lot. And uh, that's one of, of Stryker's uh, significant uh, strengths is mechanical mechanisms and electronics that are capable of surviving lots of autoclave cycles. So good question. That, which I did have an answer to it, yeah, sort of. It's really interesting. I don't see that kind of shift, but it does make sense. There are technical, robotics, and electronics, and it makes sense. So my advice to you students is be careful who you make friends with, because you might be, you, your, your paths may cross. Um, one of the guys on our team, I was his RA at Purdue. We met at Purdue um, a long time ago. And still been friends, so that's that's a good thing. Anything else? Good All right. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight. Certainly welcome. Bring his tool back. Yes.